watching a premier military attack helicopter in action, it's no wonder that many of the world's aeronauts claim that helicopters are the only real flying machines. The craft that became known as the Angel of Mercy in war has become the jack of all trades of our airways. From a transporter of some of the world's most famous and powerful individuals. To aerial firefighters putting out some of our worst forest fires. From defender and protector of our neighborhoods to the flying crane workhorses lifting over 12 tons. To one of the most important functions of this aircraft, the flying ambulance. Medevac helicopters have helped save thousands of lives a year. Yet less than 60 years ago, the only aircraft in the world that flies in three dimensions was still in its infancy. The idea of rotary flight dates back to ancient civilization. It began with a toy that became known as the Chinese top. We know for a fact that 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, the Chinese already had uh, spin top toys where you pulled a string and a propeller device flew into the air. The implications of it, however, were not realized by the Chinese at that time. As the Chinese top made its way across Europe, it quickly became a popular curio. By 1463, the top even began to show up in paintings, such as the famous Christ Child, which depicts Jesus holding one of these toys. Shortly after, in 1483, the first known design concept of a helicopter was put on paper by one of the world's most famous theorists. Leonardo da Vinci was very actively pursuing the challenge of the helicopter with that famous sketch of his and with the description that if the cloth were properly varnished and this screw-like object were turned quickly enough, it would ascend into the air. And if you look back at it, fascinating, how close Leonardo da Vinci was to solving the problem of flight. But the man was such a perfectionist that he went beyond the glider and if he had just stopped for a moment, and said, OK, I don't think I can build this, but if I just make it into a fixed wing, that man would have flown uh, 500 years ago. Da Vinci was among many scientists who were teased by maple seeds and dandelion leaves in flight, various insects and hummingbirds who hovered effortlessly in midair, turned any which way they pleased and could fly in all directions. But without a sufficient source of power to lift a man, the idea of any mechanical flight would remain for centuries a dream. By the turn of the 19th century, many visionaries had put their ideas of a rotary aircraft on paper. However, most were based on fantasy rather than reality. But by the 1840s, an English scientist, Sir George Cayley, began tackling one of the first obstacles associated with rotary flight, counteracting torque. If you take a hold of something, a, a screwdriver for instance, and you twist it in one direction, there is a uh, equal and opposite reaction in the opposite direction. And that would be the torque reaction. And when a rotor is spinning in the air, at the same time that it's turning in one direction, it's trying to twist the fuselage of the aircraft in the opposite direction. Cayley's answer to this problem was to design a helicopter with two rotors side by side. Each rotor would turn in opposite directions to counteract the forces of torque between each other. But Cayley never built his rotary aircraft. He knew that a full-sized machine based on his design would never get off the ground. See, the only power at that time really was a steam engine. And steam engine weighs about 100 pounds per horsepower. It's just impractical for vertical lift. But several years later in the 1860s, a French engineer, Viscount Gustave de Ponton de Amacor, was determined to prove to the world that rotary flight was indeed possible. De Amacor built a miniature rotary aircraft which demonstrated a new method of counteracting torque. He researched and built small flying models 
and one of them was a uh, counter-rotating uh, helicopter toy where he took a bow and would wind it up and the tension of the bow would turn one rotor in one direction. The torque of that would turn the opposite rotor. Size maybe two feet long, but it did fly. This became known as a coaxial method of handling torque. Two rotors mounted on a common axis. After proving that a properly designed coaxial rotor system would fly, the Amacor designed and built another miniature rotary aircraft. This time, he utilized tiny watch spring mechanisms for power. They too flew successfully. De Amacor came up with an enduring name for his contrivances, using the Greek words helico, meaning spiral, and pteron, meaning wing. He coined the name helicopter. But until a sufficient source of power became available enough to lift a man, helicopters would remain small, miniature prototypes. The world would have to wait another 20 years for vertical flight. By the mid-19th century, there were many failed attempts to design and build both fixed-wing and rotary-winged aircraft. But the failure of these attempts did not stem from a lack of aerodynamic knowledge. All of these early developments of aviation had to wait for the development of the internal combustion engine, the gasoline engine. Obviously, those people that were trying to fly with manpower, that is, by flapping their wings or pedaling a bicycle-like machine, uh, were doomed to failure because of the fact that the human being cannot generate that amount of energy. But in 1876, the four-stroke internal combustion engine was perfected by Germany's Nikolaus Otto. By the turn of the 20th century, the piston engine's power-to-weight ratio was at levels that assured mechanical flight possible, at least with airplanes. On December 17, 1903, near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the Wright brothers made the first controlled, sustained airplane flights in a powered, heavier-than-air vehicle. Now, the Wright engine was at about 15 pounds per horsepower. But that was possible for an airplane, but really not for a helicopter. So when the weight of the engine, reciprocating engine, got down to around three pounds per horsepower, that's when vertical lift machines would be possible. On September 29, 1907, French aviation pioneer Louis Breguet became the first to leave the ground vertically. He and his craft hovered for one minute at an altitude of two feet. However, Breguet had no control of his gyroplane number one, and his craft was tethered to the ground for safety. But on November 13, 1907, another French engineer, Paul Cornu, would also make aviation history. Hovering about a foot off the ground for several minutes, Cornu became the first person to ever rise vertically in a powered, heavier-than-air machine with no assistance from the ground. It was a true rotary free flight. But he too had little control of his machine. Although there were many engineers who followed in Cornu's footsteps, some even flying for up to seven minutes, they all had the same problem, lack of complete control. In contrast, by the 1920s, United States Army Air Service planes were making the first flights around the entire world it seemed that helicopter technology had quickly fallen behind that of the airplane. In 1925, a Spaniard, Juan de la Sierva, put the idea of a helicopter back into mainstream development. His invention, a completely new type of aircraft, the autogyro. Well, an autogyro has a rotor and when the aircraft is moving forward through the air, the rotor acts a little bit like a windmill, where the forward motion of the aircraft moving through the air causes it to rotate. And when it rotates, it again is a rotating wing and is producing lift. But the forward motion of the autogyro is produced by a propeller very similar to what you would have on an airplane. An autogyro, which wasn't really vertical, lift on the takeoff, but vertical lift landing, they could auto-rotate down and 
with very low ground run, plop down right in front of everybody, and especially at air shows, they would demonstrate that capability. This method of landing is the same basic approach that a modern helicopter would take should its engine fail. Back in the 1920s, Juan de la Sierva proved to the world that to make a safe landing in a helicopter required no engine power and no runway, just a spot big enough for the aircraft. The key to de la Sierva's stable aircraft was his discovery of a phenomenon that only became apparent with rotary-winged aircraft, dissymmetry of lift. De La Sierva had the same annoying problem that many early helicopter designers had. Their craft would tip over before ever leaving the ground. This happened because most rotor blades at the time were rigid. Rotating blades never generate the same force of lift equally throughout their revolution. This causes an imbalance of lift. De La Sierva's solution? He attached hinges to each blade, which allowed them to move fore and aft, and up and down. This would allow the rotor blades to find their own way through the air. You see, as the forward-going blade goes into the air, it gets a lot more lift and it wants to rise. And as it rotates around and goes with the air, then it wants to sink. And prior to that, then, most of the aircraft would have rolled over. He allowed the blade to flap up and as it goes around then to flap down. If it gets too much lift, it flaps up. As it goes around and loses lift because it's going with the wind, it starts to settle. And so this was a self-accommodating sort of thing. So Juan de la Sierva figured that out and was able to build a controllable, flyable autogyro back in the 20s. Early autogyros had small wings to help steer the aircraft. But these wings disappeared in the early 1930s when cyclic pitch control was developed. This device was based on the problem that De La Sierva had just solved, dissymmetry of lift. The thought was take control of this imbalance of lift and use it to steer the aircraft. It wasn't until the uh, cyclic pitch, where we can change the pitch as we go around the blade, so it might go high on this side and low on that side, that people began using cyclic pitch to help control this rotor. And so then, uh, in hovering, where you have no forward flight speed, they were able then to tilt the rotor so as to be able to go laterally, or tilt the rotor so as to go longitudinally. This is the same basic device that steers a modern helicopter. When the cyclic stick is moved, a device at the base of the rotor hub alters the pitch of each rotor blade individually as it goes through its cycle of rotation. So where the pitch in a blade is greater, it grabs more air and the blade rises higher. Where the pitch is less, the blade swings lower because it has less air to catch on its surface. The overall effect with this system is the change in the rotor plane which enables directional control. Modern helicopters also have collective pitch control. Simply put, this lever changes the pitch of all the rotor blades evenly or collectively. This way, the pilot can lift off vertically, steer the aircraft, and with the cyclic stick compensate for those forces of unequal lift. Thanks to these new technological breakthroughs back in the 1930s, the autogyro achieved practical success. The Detroit News used one to speed reporters to the scene of major stories. The U.S. Postal Service began test flights for its deliveries. There were even demonstrations held on the White House lawn for President Hoover, who called the autogyro the greatest achievement in aviation. Harold Pitcairn, who was licensed by De La Sierva to build autogyros in the United States, even foresaw a future where autogyros would make automobiles obsolete. He designed a Pitcairn rotable and demonstrated it on the streets of Washington, D.C. The rotable vehicle was all part of Pitcairn's dream, which he depicted in his promotional material, to have an autogyro in every garage. Well, Harold Pitcairn built 
some auto generals here in the United States back in the mid-1930s, which was right in the middle of the Great Depression, and nobody really had money for anything at that time. So. But unfortunately, the auto gyro, combined with its complexity and high cost, never allowed it to actually be that competitive. The auto gyro's fate was sealed when in December 1940, its 41-year-old inventor, Juan de la Sierva, was killed in a commuter airplane accident in London. But by solving many of the auto gyro's problems, de la Sierva and his colleagues had opened the way at last for the practical helicopter. The world wouldn't have to wait long Two men working independently of each other were about to push helicopters into the modern era. By the middle 1930s, there had been many complicated machines built in hopes of achieving controlled vertical flight. Few would ever do more than scoot across the ground. But in 1936, a German airplane engineer, Heinrich Falker, had gone beyond conventional thinking. Why go to an elaborate new machine? He felt that the trusty autogyro was so close he would simply build upon its basic design. Professor Heinrich Focke was a very brilliant aerodynamicist, a very, very great pioneer who started with the autogyro and then built up his know-how of rotary wings and the lifting and the vibrations and the capabilities. And from there, it was almost a natural step for him in 1935, 1936, to attack the problem of the helicopter, which he very successfully attacked. It resulted in the building of two small helicopters. The two main rotors of the Fock helicopter were side by side. There was one on the left, one on the right. And by rotating in opposite directions, one counteracted the torque of the other. And it had a small propeller in the front that looked like an airplane propeller, but was actually just used to cool the engine. But it was a true helicopter. Heinrich Falke had built the world's first real helicopter. Although it was difficult to fly and maneuver, it could hover, fly sideways, and fly forward or backward. But for all the amazing feats that Falke's F-A-61 helicopter achieved, it had little impact on a public already familiar with airplanes and auto gyros. That is, until the attractive and daring 25-year-old Hanna Reich, known throughout Germany as that nation's first woman test pilot, climbed into the cockpit. Hanna Reich was a very gifted test pilot, a very, very tiny, tiny uh, little lady uh, probably weighing 98 pounds, sopping wet, which was very good for improving the performance. You didn't want a big tank of a guy climbing into an aircraft which had marginal performance. Her flights and her demonstration flights uh, were highly publicized, and those public demonstrations, I think, were pivotal to the cause of the helicopter. In February 1938, Reich demonstrated the Falke helicopter inside Berlin's cavernous Deutschlandhalle Sports Arena every night for three weeks. She flew from a court about the size uh, of a basketball court and would take off, fly, hover, turn 360 degrees. And when the films reached uh, the United States, I think they also uh, created a tremendous amount of interest in the helicopter here. And Heiner Reich, interestingly enough, is a member of an organization that I'm a member of, which is the International Women Helicopter Pilots, um, more commonly or better known as the Whirly Girls. And because Hannah Wright was the first woman to ever pilot a helicopter, she's considered Whirly Girl number one. And presently, we have over a thousand members of the Whirly Girls, and all of them must be rated pilots, and they're from 28 different countries. As Hanna Reich continued to break virtually every helicopter world's record, an American-Russian immigrant, Igor Sikorsky, was about to change the course of helicopter history. Igor Sikorsky was no stranger to aeronautics. By the mid-1920s, he had built one of the most successful airplane companies in the world, Sikorsky Aviation. In 1929, the company became a subsidiary of United Aircraft. 
giving Sikorsky time to pursue a lifelong dream, helicopters. As a boy in Russia in 1909, Sikorsky had built several unsuccessful helicopters, but by 1931 he was ready to tackle the task again. Dad got back into helicopters uh, in the very early 1930s. Uh, at that time, his, uh, you could say his work, nine to five, were the large clipper ships, the flying boats for Pan American Airways and for a number of other airlines. But already in 1931, 32, 33, you begin to see the sketches increasing uh, in volume, the sketches of a helicopter. And by 1935, 1936 already, I was building small little models that he would then demonstrate to his engineers or take up to the board of directors of United Aircraft, as it was called in those days. Sikorsky's sketches resulted in a unique design for the time period, a single main rotor. Up until the late 1930s, most helicopters that had lifted off the ground were either coaxial in design or had at least two main rotors, such as the Falca helicopter. A number of people had tried uh, to build a single main lifting rotor machine, uh, but actually none of them were successful until that time. And in fact, great many authorities considered the single main lifting rotor machine to be technically and theoretically impossible. It just could not be done. However, by 1936, 1938, Igor Sikorsky had zeroed in and sat down on this concept and was beginning to develop the necessary hardware, the necessary design philosophy for a single rotor machine. On September 14, 1939, Sikorsky began cautious flight tests in his single main rotor VS-300. He kept his craft tethered to the ground while he slowly worked the kinks out of his design. Concentrating heavily on how to control his craft, Sikorsky focused on a rear tail rotor configuration. He tried everything from no tail rotor to three tail rotors. He was trying to obtain some of the other control movements of the helicopter with these other rotors. He finally got rid of the rest of the other ones and ended up with a single tail rotor back there to counteract torque and also to give the, the pilot control of rotating the helicopter to the left or rotating it to the right. So the tail rotor really performs both of those functions, counteracting torque and providing directional control. The tail rotor was, and it still is, with modern helicopters, controlled with foot pedals. When the pilot wants to turn the helicopter to the left, he pushes the left pedal in, which decreases the angle of the rear rotor blades, allowing the natural forces of torque to turn the fuselage to the left. Pushing in the right pedal increases the pitch of the rear rotor blades, causing them to bite the air harder and overcompensates the forces of torque and the aircraft swings to the right. But for Igor Sikorsky in 1940, creating this design concept did not happen overnight. There were many flight tests that would demand numerous modifications, so many that Sikorsky's mechanics affectionately nicknamed the VS-300 as Igor's nightmare. The memories are very vivid of the very early flights of VS-300. Those benign, beautiful, warm spring days of 1940, as the helicopter would be hovering uh, just in a parking lot behind the Sikorsky factory. And I remember you could touch it the way you could touch a living thing, like a horse or a dog. And you had that affection for it. Igor Sikorsky's VS-300 was America's first successful helicopter. His design and patent became the basis for future modern helicopters. The Army Air Force at that time became very interested in the aircraft and gave him $50,000 to finish the development of that aircraft. United Aircraft, of course, had a lot of money to that, and they developed then under Air Force contract the XR-4. And that's the aircraft that's sitting behind me as the first then production aircraft. This is one of, this is the only remaining prototype of the XR-4. By the end of World War II, over 400 Sikorsky helicopters had rolled off the assembly lines. 
Military leaders first thought of the helicopter as a scouting tool. But the helicopter quickly proved to be capable of much more. During the last years of World War II, many stranded victims were rescued in spots that only the helicopter could reach. The military was impressed with the life-saving potential of this new machine. The helicopter had shown that it could be a truly useful aircraft, a rotary-winged angel of mercy. In years to come, it would be that and more in peace as well as war. Early helicopter pioneers all had one thing in common. There wasn't much of a technological track record to follow. Much of the early designs were based on intuition. Well, use your best judgment and your imagination and do what you think you have to do to conceive and develop a system that will work. If it works, you made it like we did 55 years ago on the 11th of April, 1943. Frank Piasecki built and flew America's second successful helicopter, the Piasecki PV-2. Just like Igor Sikorsky before him, Piasecki's first flights in a helicopter were tethered to the ground for safety. It was a kind of a windy day, but we started the machine up and we had my mother's clotheslines I borrowed to hold the machine to the ground. And all of a sudden, a gust of wind came along and lifted me up off the ground, broke the ropes. Everybody ran away. And just by some stroke of the Lord, I moved my head in the right direction and countered the, the turn that the wind did and came back on the ground and stopped. And the machine was saved. And that was our first takeoff. Piasecki's PV-2 helicopter evolved into a fully controllable aircraft. Just like the other early helicopter pioneers, Piasecki's machine took months to perfect. Not only were engineers dealing with the unknown, but with helicopter technology being so complex and so new, gathering support for such endeavors wasn't always easy. If you said, I'm designing a helicopter, People would look upon you as a nut. It was known that it had a lot of failures by many different people and many uh, celebrated engineers. And therefore, who the hell are you that you're going to design a helicopter that will fly? So get out of my way. But by the time the clouds of World War II began to part, more than 50 companies were working at helicopter development, all hoping for a governmental contract. It was Frank Piasecki who got the attention of the Navy. Frank Piasecki designed a helicopter that had two rotors, but instead of being a lateral twin, meaning that it had rotors on each side, he put one of the main rotors at the forward end of the helicopter and the other main rotor at the aft end of the helicopter. Again, they rotated in opposite directions so that each one compensated for the torque reaction of the other. And the Navy then gave us an order for 10 of them because they wanted to try out a squadron of them. And with those 10, they were able to apply this new thing that they had, which gave them 1,800 pounds of vertical lift, which gave them more speed, which gave them more maneuverability, towing things, for instance, mine sweeping. Piasecki built several variations of tandem rotor helicopters. Shortly after World War II, they were in use with the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. However, by August 1950, the armed forces found themselves in desperate need for hundreds of new helicopters in a war that no one expected. Without a doubt, the Korean War uh, convinced all of the skeptics because within a few months after the start of the war the helicopter had gone to almost priority number one. It was used for medical evacuation. It began to be used for the rescue of pilots down behind enemy lines. 
At first, the majority of the helicopters in use were Frank Piasecki's PV-3s, more commonly known as flying bananas. Also in use were Igor Sikorsky's S-51 helicopters. But for medical evacuation, a smaller, lightweight helicopter was needed. The design came from a brilliant young inventor, Arthur Young, who worked for the famous Bell Aircraft Corporation. Young had built America's third successful helicopter, the Bell Model 30. This craft first flew on June 26, 1943, only two months after Piasecki had lifted off the ground for the first time. Yet two years later, after an evolution of refinements and improvements, Arthur Young churned out the Bell 47 helicopter. The Bell 47 became the symbol of hope for American soldiers during the Korean War. They soon became an integral part of MASH units, or Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals. With its bulbous plastic cockpit, the Bell 47 quickly became one of the most recognizable helicopters in the world. Its characteristic clop, 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 clop sound resulted in the coined term chopper. And by the end of the Korean War, uh, I believe the helicopter had evacuated well over 100,000 wounded troops and had what is equally significant, had rescued and brought to safety something like 1,200 pilots from behind enemy lines. Men that would have faced capture, starvation, torture, and probably death if it had not been for the helicopter. In 1953, the Korean War was over, but helicopters would soon become more than scout and rescue machines. They would become a viable military weapon in a distant conflict that would become known as the Helicopter War. However, harmony between helicopters and the military in Vietnam would take a little time. Virtually all helicopters utilized piston engines, which relative to their size and weight were bulky and weak. When enlarged, they took up too much space and could barely lift themselves and a large payload. The military quickly turned to the turbine engine a source of power that throughout the 1950s was still in the experimental stages. But by the 1960s, after a series of refinements and improvements, the turbine engine was in mass production. The turbines were not introduced into helicopters until the mid to late 50s. And by the time the Vietnam War had gotten into full swing, the military had converted most of its helicopters to turbine engines and again those helicopters were all fairly large and the turbine engine functions very well in helicopters of that size it gives them a much better uh, power to weight ratio a turbine engine has a spinning fan that sucks air into a combustion chamber where it is mixed with fuel and ignited as the fuel burns, it produces hot gases, which shoot into the turbine, causing it to spin. Attached is a shaft that turns the rotor and any other devices connected to it, such as gearboxes for the rear tail rotor and power generators, etc. A reciprocating engine, for the, for the horsepower it delivers, its weight, weight to, to horsepower ratio is, is generally about equal. So, I mean, if, if you had a 400 horsepower engine, it's going to weigh about 400 pounds. Uh, in a turbine engine, it's about half. If you have a 400 horsepower engine, it's going to weigh about 200 pounds. And in a helicopter, just like any aircraft, weight is precious. It was a turbine-driven helicopter that became the symbol of the Vietnam War. The Bell HU-1, more commonly known as the Huey, a nickname the Army pilots came up with based on the helicopter's initials. My first few months in Vietnam was flying Hueys. I think the Huey was the most versatile helicopter in the Vietnam War. And, and like I said, I think it became one of the most versatile helicopters ever built. Just by its pure design and its capabilities, easy to train pilots for. Take enough troops, a, a squad say. Uh, you could put hard mounts on the outside of the aircraft and turn it into a gun platform if it had to be. You could put litters inside and, and use it as an air ambulance. You could take an aircraft 
and configure it very quickly for three or four or five different kind of missions. But flying these machines in war exposed both pilot and aircraft to great risk. While rescuing wounded soldiers, often from the front lines, helicopters became large moving air targets for the enemy. There was really nothing really bulletproof about a Huey other than that it was a pretty simple design and there was a few critical components and if they were hit, uh, it would knock it out of the sky. There was a lot of helicopters lost in Vietnam and a lot of helicopter pilots lost their lives in Vietnam because of just the pure exposure, just the amount of hours that were flown. But there was not a more welcome sight to American troops fighting in flooded paddies and look-alike villages than that of the Bell HU-1. The Huey was looked upon as an angel of mercy, one of the most respected machines of that war. I think of the Huey affectionately because we were raised with it. In fact, I'm getting, you know, you get a little emotional just thinking about it. That pop, 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 pop. so classic of a Huey. I went from being an apprehensive, manipulator of the controls to becoming a helicopter pilot in the Huey. And I think I'll just always remember that. I'm very fortunate that uh, our department operates a surplus Huey, and I occasionally get to fly it. And, and I hope it's the last helicopter I fly. I'll always have a soft spot in my, in my heart for the Huey. By the end of the Vietnam conflict, the helicopter had proven itself as an efficient and ubiquitous servant in war. But soon, the world would see that the most dramatic helicopter duty remained the same in peace as in war, rescue. Less than 20 years after the birth of the modern helicopter, the world became reliant upon its existence. I think certainly that to the army of the United States, and I would dare say to the armies of a number of military services around the world, the helicopter certainly is as indispensable as the jet fighter is to the air forces of the world. It does provide you simply with the capability to continue military operations in areas that would be inaccessible with anything but the helicopter. Currently, the latest in helicopter technology can be found in some of the various military machines such as the Boeing Sikorsky Comanche. This stealth machine can fly at speeds up to 200 miles per hour and execute snap turns in 4.5 seconds. The Comanche can fly sideways or backwards at 70 miles per hour while the pilot utilizes the craft's advanced radar and infrared sensors. In seconds, the Comanche's computers can scan miles of a battlefield instantly prioritize all hostile targets including tanks trucks and even other helicopters while displaying the targets for crew identification the system selects the optimum weapon to neutralize each either from its own extensive weapon systems or by relaying encrypted information to other air or ground commanders but the civilian side of helicopter technology is no less important Helicopters are always on standby for our safety and benefit. A lot of people don't realize one of the special functions of a helicopter in a large metropolitan area is when the corporate helicopters are members of a disaster relief program. And in the New York City area, for example, all the corporate helicopters that fly around not only just fly the executives around to save time and uh, bring in a lot of business to the area, which is very important for the economy, but should an unexpected disaster occur, for example, some kind of a bombing or just some kind of a national disaster, the helicopters would all rally in support of the community. And this is something that we do in addition, just as a community service. Today, I think we can say as a rough ballpark figure, that well over one and a half million human lives directly saved by the helicopter, by the intervention of the helicopter. Helicopters also act as aerial firefighters. They can access much smaller water supplies than tanker planes. These monster Ericsson air cranes can quickly suck up over 2,000 gallons of water and then with precise accuracy dispense the water over the affected area.
Without these air cranes, many industrial projects would cost millions of dollars more to build. There is no need to impact the environment with roads, as these heavy lift Ericsson helicopters aid in power line construction. Remote logging. And major equipment transportation. This unit is one of the first unmanned helicopters being developed for law enforcement and the military. Utilizing a single main rotor protected in the middle of the aircraft, this Sikorsky rotorcraft performs a variety of functions, including capturing live footage and transmitting it back to a safely isolated base station. Unmanned helicopters may one day be a common sight. Oh, the future of helicopters is absolutely exciting. Um, just a branch off from the helicopter is the tilt rotor, and that's where I think that you're going to mesh the vertical flight and horizontal flight. In fact, what it is is the tilt rotor is the best of both worlds. You can land and take off like a helicopter and have the speed and range of an airplane. Man's thirst for perfecting three-dimensional flight appears to be an unfinished quest. But whatever we achieve in the future, the helicopter will always remain our source of inspiration. But I think the most special thing about the helicopter is the fact that it allowed man to live what had been considered up to now a dream. The ability to take off and land vertically and the ability to hover motionless in the air is something that literally only the helicopter can give mankind. My father, Igor Sikorsky, would often say that it's interesting that all of the great early legends of flight, the Pegasus, the flying carpets, the flying thrones of the Chinese, all of these had one thing in common. They did not need an airport. These were all vertical takeoff and landing machines. So that is what I consider to be the uniqueness of the helicopter.